working all right? Yeah. And I'd like to take your thoughts today to something that is very much a part of Seventh-day Adventism. So if you're not a Seventh-day Adventist today, um, you might find this a little mysterious, and uh, that could be interesting, but let me assure you that it's not dangerous. It's uh, beneficial. I want to talk a little bit about the risk that we run in the last days of Earth's history that is probably more significant than any other thing that might tend to uh, cause us to lose our salvation. There are a lot of things that we tend to list as Seventh-day Adventists which could cause us to lose our salvation. We say we might have a, uh, we might have a problem with the church. The church people are not treating me well and so I'm not going to go to that church anymore. So we stay away from church. Well, that's not you because you're here today. The people who need to hear about that are not here, so we won't talk about that. There may be that uh, we come to some different conclusions from the study of the scripture than the church has concluded on over the years. And we've become so emphatic about our own solution to a difficult text or our own understanding of some particular Bible theme that we decide that we can't hang in there with the church any longer. We've got to step out on our own. And we say this is a risk that we will lose our place in the kingdom because our independence is based upon our own personal idea instead of uh, thus saith the Lord. So we have a risk. And then, of course, there's those other terrible things that we get a little bit discouraged and we get downhearted and we think that God is not with us anymore. And so we don't worry about uh, prayer and we don't worry about Bible reading at all. And uh, we don't worry about associating ourselves with church members and Christian people. And uh, hence we can lose our enthusiasm for what the Lord has done and uh, we could lose our faith. Worse than that, of course, we might happen to fall back into some of our own uh, uh, old ways and uh, uh, take to, to alcohol or to lose living or uh, 101 things that could blind our sensitivities, our spiritual sensitivities, so that we end up leaving the faith and losing our faith. But I've come to the conclusion after reading in the book of Hebrews that Paul, if he wrote the book of Hebrews, and I'll claim that he did, and I will be saying today that Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. If you differ, that's okay, because we don't really know who wrote it, but it seems as though Paul knew uh, <coughs> so much about this sort of stuff Seems that he wrote the book of Hebrews, and I'll say he did. And uh, uh, Paul seemed to be more concerned about something else. He seemed to be more concerned that we might lose our understanding of the work of our great high priest in heaven. He seemed to consider that was one of the big concerns as he wrote to the Hebrew Christians. Because most of what he says in the book of Hebrews is related to the fact that Jesus is our great high priest in heaven. And if we lose sight of that fact, we lose sight of something that is absolutely fundamental to Christianity. And I would suggest to you that Christianity, by and large, across the world today, where the name Christianity is used in many and very different uh, uh, situations, of course, they have lost or have never fully understood what Seventh-day Adventists have been blessed to understand, and that is the work and the ministry of our Heavenly High Priest. If there is one unique contribution that Seventh-day Adventists have made to the, Christians, uh, the Christian world, it is the understanding of the High Priestly ministry of Jesus. It's true that it is referred to and it is understood partially by many people, but not entirely. And I'm not going to talk today specifically and in detail about the ministry 
of Jesus, our high priest. I'm going to talk more about the risk of losing our <coughs> assurance that comes to an understanding of what our high priest does. And so I'm assuming today that most of you know what I'm talking about when I talk about the high priestly ministry of Jesus. But uh, <coughs> to make it simple and perhaps a little easier to understand, I should take a moment or two to explain what a high priest was and considered to be and what his work and duties were and what benefit uh, it was to the Israelites and to the Jews to have this understanding. You see, back in the times of Israel, when God had led the children of Israel out of Egypt into the promised land, he set up a system of ceremonies which was to illustrate the plan that God would use for saving human beings from the bondage of sin. And it is assumed and is understood, and the Bible teaches that all human beings have been locked into the sin problem, that we've been locked into a rebellion against God, and that we can't get out of it unless there is some divine activity, some God-given activity operating in our lives. And if that divine activity is not operating, and if we're not in cooperation with God, then we are locked into the sin thing, which of course has its author in Lucifer, um, whom we call Satan, the deceiver, the old devil, and so on. And so God set up this system, and uh, it essentially revolved around making sacrifices. And <coughs> the sacrifices had to be brought to a priest. And so there was a tribe of the Israelites that God set aside because of their um, loyalty to him, the tribe of Levi, were set aside to be priests in the economy, if you like to call it the economy of Israel, which became generally known as the Jewish economy. And so when a person sinned and recognized their sin, they had to bring an offering most times it was a lamb or a kid from uh, a goat. Sometimes it was a bird. And uh, sometimes it was just in matter of uh, meal, like uh, uh, flour, sometimes in, in baked uh, uh, cooking, and uh, in uh, grape juice. And uh, sometimes uh, with oil added, sometimes a little bit of salt and so on. But they had to bring an offering. It had to be brought to a priest. It was no good going to your neighbor with your offering. God said, that is not satisfactory. You can't just go to your neighbor and say, I'm making an offering. It had to go to a priest. There were many priests, of course, and over time, the numbers of priests multiplied and the priests served at the temple um, in different courses throughout the year. And most times they served for one fortnight of a year, one group, that's as time went on. In the time of Jesus, they had uh, these courses of priests, groups of priests, and the people were still expected to take an offering to the priest. And uh, as they brought their offering, and as they brought their sacrificial offering, which of course had to be a lamb, the priest and uh, <coughs> the person who brought it were involved in killing the lamb, and the blood of that sacrifice was taken into the special area called the sanctuary, and uh, there the blood was, uh, was put in different places, and I won't detail all of this. The whole thing representing that instead of the sinner who brought the sacrifice, who brought the offering, dying for his sins, a substitute would die in their place. And they would be considered to be free from the responsibility of that sin. God knowing that all of us, all humanity, is tied up in the sin problem. And the only way we can get out of it is to align ourselves with God, align ourselves with our Creator who is holy and just and uh, who has never sinned. And in doing that, we align ourselves with Jesus Christ. Well, that's how it went up to the time of Jesus' sacrifice. But besides all those priests, there was one who was more significant than all the other priests put together. And that was the high priest. You know this very well, most of you. The high priest was significant in that 
he was not chosen from amongst all the other priests. Now, that's what we do today. Today, we choose a conference president of one of our, our general church activities here in, uh, in the North Island of New Zealand. And we all get together and representatives from the churches get together and they choose someone to be the leading person. They call him the president. And then other groups get together and they choose someone who will be the leading president of the uh, division area that covers the Pacific area, including New Zealand. And then other groups get together and they will choose uh, someone who will lead the whole world church. And all the world church will come under the, the, uh, the guidance of the general conference president. But that's not how the high priest was chosen. The high priest was chosen by God. The high priest was chosen by God and Aaron, uh, Moses' brother, was chosen by God to be the high priest. The high priest did something a little different than all the other priests. The high priest dressed a little differently. There were special clothes for the high priest. There was a special system of anointing or initiation for the high priest. There was a special place for the high priest to live. There were special rules about the high priest's family. There were special rules about who the high priest's family could marry and special rules about whether certain food could be eaten and taken by the high priest. The high priest stood out a little differently because the high priest represented something that goes on in heaven. Moses was told to make something that represented that which goes on in heaven. And there is a high priest in heaven. And uh, the Apostle Paul, I believe, is telling the Hebrew people that there is a high priest in heaven who is the real high priest. And he is different. He is different from all the other priests that have served, Paul says. He is different. And he says there is a risk that you will cease to understand and appreciate what the high priest in heaven is doing for you. And if you cease to appreciate it, having once known and learnt what the high priest in heaven is doing for you, you run the risk of losing your salvation. <clears throat> Let's have a look in the book of Hebrews for a minute or two and refer to some text. That's a rather lengthy introduction, but I hope it forms some basis. Hebrews chapter 2 and the first two verses. And here are some of the warnings. I'm going to read some of these verses. Therefore, he says, we ought to give more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, unless at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast and certain, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense or a payment of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? So Paul says here, we ought to give more earnest heed to the things that we've heard. Now he has uh, been able to instruct the early Christians, the Hebrew Christians, probably in Rome, living in Rome, he's been able to instruct them about the work of Jesus. He's been able to instruct him, them that Jesus is the saviour of the world and that Jesus dying on the cross has died for our sins and has fulfilled all those sacrificial offerings that were given, hundreds and thousands and thousands of them, some of them given in absolute sincerity of heart and some of them given out of habit and tradition. But Jesus fulfilled it all with his one death upon the cross. He was the one who paid for our sins. No animal could pay for our sins. No human could pay for our sins because all humans are sinners anyhow. They have their own to deal with. And even the high priest Aaron and his sons and their descendants couldn't pay for our sins because they too had to take offerings and make their, their uh, sacrifices, acknowledging that they too were sinners and that they only represented that great high priest who lived in heaven and he did a work for humanity up there that is done for all of humanity across the whole of the universe, the whole of the world through the whole passage 
of time. And so Paul says we need to give more earnest heed to this. I wonder if these messages are not written for us today as well. For we are an enlightened people as Seventh-day Adventists, but are we taking heed of that which we ought to know, that which we do know? Let's have a look in chapter 3. Uh, I want to read a few verses here from verse 1. Wherefore, holy brethren, the sea is acknowledging that they are people who belong to the Lord. They have joined the church. They are good Christians. But he says, Behold, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. The word apostle means the one who brings the good news and the bearer of good news and the high priest, and he calls Jesus our high priest, the one who we hold in what we understand and believe in our confession. His name is Jesus Christ. He was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all that he did. So here we have the connection here between the heavenly high priest, Jesus, and uh, the contrast between Moses as, uh, and, uh, and Aaron as uh, they continued, as they did their work down here for the Israelites and establishing the Jewish nation. Moses was faithful and he was taken to heaven. Jesus is a faithful high priest, but far more significant than Moses, and he is in heaven doing a work for us there. Let's go down to verse 12, and it says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ or partners with Christ in that if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast and firmly to the end. So Paul is concerned that these Christians might let go of this marvellous understanding of Jesus as our high priest. Well, perhaps we should stop a moment and think to ourselves about the work of a high priest in contrast to the work of an ordinary priest. Up until Jesus' time, the Jews were expected, in fact, they were instructed in all these matters, and the high priest's most significant work, although it was, uh, he was employed uh, for the benefit of the people throughout the year, his most significant work was on that Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement, the end of the year, when all sin was signified to have been dealt with, when the high priest, all on his own, symbolically took the sins of the people that had been placed in that sanctuary there, from the sacrifices that had been made through the year, hundreds and hundreds of them perhaps. And symbolically those sins were placed there in the sanctuary awaiting to be dealt with finally and completely and securely so that they never need to be dealt with again. And the great high priest would deal with that all on his own. You can read about it there uh, <coughs> in, uh, in the book of Leviticus. And uh, the high priest would go in and he would symbolically take the sins that were there and deal with them in a little ceremony, deal with them once and for all. And symbolically the sins were placed onto what was called a scapegoat. And he was sent out into the wilderness into a place where he would never be seen or heard of again. And it symbolized the fact that Jesus, our high priest, deals with our sins. He is the only one who can finalize the problem of sin. And this is the area that Paul is worried about when he speaks to the Hebrews. He's worried that they might conceive that there is some other way that their sins can finally be dealt with. But Paul is saying there is only one way that sins can be dealt with, and that's to ultimately hand them over to the high priest of our calling, Jesus Christ, and let him deal with them. When they've been handed over to him, we are not 
to seek to get them back. When we've handed our sins over to Jesus, we are to believe and to understand as he has promised that they went with him to the cross. And at the cross, they were dealt with. At the cross, sin was dealt with. And we never need to forget that. And I fear that Seventh-day Adventists in their enthusiasm for being correct in all this area have sometimes failed to understand the true significance of what Jesus did on the cross. I heard it said when I was a young Adventist and in my teen years, I heard it said so often that uh, when Jesus died on the cross, he started the ball rolling. He started the ball of our salvation rolling. I actually believed it for a while. Now I think it's gross heresy. Jesus didn't start the plan of salvation rolling at the cross because the scripture tells me that the plan of salvation was started in heaven before the world began. And the plan of God to save human beings if they should sin was started before he made the world. And just like a good scientist who may be making perhaps or trying to make a vaccine to deal with a flu or with some other disease, he will at the same time make an antidote for it. And before he releases the vaccine, he will have an antidote in case the vaccine goes wild and he can do something about it. And the same goes with all kinds of chemicals and so on that are produced for agriculture, horticulture and for all kinds of things. There's an antidote. Uh, produced at the same time. And before God created the world, he created an antidote for the problem of sin. And that antidote was that Jesus, that one-third part of the Godhood, would come and deal with the problem of sin. So the cross of Jesus didn't start the ball rolling. The cross of Jesus put some termination to the problem of sin because that was the time when the absolute assurance that sin could be dealt with occurred. Because back in the Old Testament times, when the people brought their sacrifices <coughs> day by day or year by year, and remember there was always a sacrifice offered every day for the sins of all the people anyway, um, the scripture tells us that couldn't make anybody holy. Why? Because the sins were never finally dealt with because Jesus had not died. They had to wait and hold in abeyance, in promise, in hope, in hope more than just a wish, but in, in hope, in looking forward to the time when Jesus would come and he would deal that day of atonement activity which would deal with sin. Now, there's more to the day of atonement than this, <clears throat> and I'm not going to go into that uh, today. We don't have time. <clears throat> but Paul is concerned that people are seeing the life and the death, the crucifixion of Jesus as being of little more worth than what a earthly high priest did. And he is warning the church that we need to be careful that we see Jesus in his true role as our high priest. No one is going to be saved for the kingdom unless they come under the good favor of Jesus Christ, our high priest. Unless they have been dealt with by Jesus the high priest unless they have passed <coughs> through his hands in other words <coughs> chapter 4 verse 1 reads let us therefore fear or be aware uh, cautiously in case a promise being left us of entering into his rest any of you should seem to come short of us. And then Paul goes on to talk about what had been hoped for the children of Israel. God had hoped that the children of Israel would one day come to the point where they would totally rely upon him. But you know what happened to them, don't you? They started to rely upon themselves. They started to look for assistant saviors. One of their assistant saviors was to be absolutely meticulous in taking their offerings and performing the rites and ceremonies around the temple. God said he didn't like 10,000 bulls being offered. That didn't excite him at all. What he preferred was a contrite heart. He didn't want a whole lot of blood and guts and gore around the temple. 
as a sign of repentance. He wanted someone with a heart that said, I'm sorry, Lord, that I have offended you and that I have <coughs> gone against your wishes. <coughs> Another way that they uh, attempted well, uh, to, to uh, uh, make some, uh, give some assistance to their salvation <coughs> was to be absolutely perfect in their detail of keeping rules. It was more important in detail to keep rules than it was to have a good attitude towards them. And so when Jesus came, they paid tithe on their little pot plants of herbs that grew on the steps leading up to their houses. Jesus said it's a good thing to pay tithe, but it's not a good thing to think that paying tithe, picking off one out of ten leaves of mint and one out of ten sprigs of parsley and paying tithe that way, he said, with the idea that it would add to your salvation, that wouldn't help. And then, of course, they had this other idea that uh, they could add to salvation, add to God's plan of salvation by doing everything correctly around the temple. That certain things had to be done at the temple in order to get salvation. And so it was essential at certain times that people arrived at the temple. And although God had said that at certain times of the year the men should go up to the temple and there should be celebrations from time to time, the Jews had laid these things down as if they were uh, absolutely imperative for salvation. And because many people couldn't do that, the Jewish leaders said there's a lot of people out there that they call dogs they said, there are people out there who are indifferent to our religion. They'll never be saved, but we will. And so the Pharisee could stand on the street corner and pray with his hands out. We always thought they prayed like this, like we do. But you know what, how that came about? That came about from the Roman uh, armies, Roman uh, uh, generals. Uh, when they forced submission to the people that they conquered, they made them stand before them and hold their hands like this and vow that they would be faithful to the Roman emperor. And now that's why we hold our hands like that and teach our kids to pray like that. Strange, isn't it? Not, not wrong, I don't think, because we use it for a different thing. But the man could stand on the street corner with his arms out there. You know why he chose the street corner? Because the people down that side could see and the people down that side could see. You can see four ways if you pick the right street corner. And they would pray with all the earnestness of hypocrisy. And they thought that that added something to salvation. And Paul is worried that the Christians of his day were wanting to add something in there from the human perspective that could help them with their salvation. And he says, I want you to consider Jesus Christ. Verse 14, we're in chapter 4, says, Seeing then that we have such a great high priest, that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold on firmly to our profession. Let us hold on firmly to what we have believed, to the truth about Jesus Christ as our great high priest. What is it that our great high priest does today that is so important for us? I'll tell you, first of all, his character. His character is the kind of character that we need. And we look up to Jesus, our great high priest, because he, with his perfect and holy and pure character, can stand before God the Father, the God of the universe, without shame, without being red-faced or without trembling in fear. He can stand there and he can come boldly before the Father because he is sinless. Our great high priest is sinless. And because he is sinless, he is able to stand before God the Father for us. He is our great intercessor. He is our great go-between. And there is nothing that we can add to the work of church and religion that will make it any better for us to stand before God. We can only stand before God because Jesus is there. Oh, yes, we will change a lot of things in our lives because Jesus is there. We'll do a lot of things because we appreciate what he has done for us. 
And we won't want to offend him and we won't want to belittle the sacrifice that he made for us in giving his life in place of our lives. And we will change our lives because of our appreciation of him, because of our love for him. We will change our lives. I suggest to you that uh, those of you who are married or have been married have done a lot of things in your life that you would not normally do simply because you loved your spouse. Things that you maybe didn't enjoy doing, you will do because you love your spouse. And some of those things that you never really enjoyed doing become quite enjoyable. For instance, I even dry the dishes. Although I bought a new dishwasher a while ago to fill the gap in the kitchen or something because it doesn't get used very much. And I hate drying dishes. And so I don't think I'm a big hero because I dry dishes. I dry dishes because it's a good time and we, we, uh, we talk away sometimes or we think, of, think each other's thoughts while we dry dishes. We do it because we love each other. And the only good thing that you will do as a Christian will be because the Holy Spirit has put it in your heart to love the God and to love the Saviour who has died for you and you will make those changes. But if you decide that you will make those changes because it's going to give you some brownie points for heaven, you will be sadly mistaken and you will end up to be a Pharisee who stands on the street corner and says, I'm glad that I'm not like other men. And sure enough, you're not. You're proud and you're arrogant. And the proud and the arrogant are not going to inherit the kingdom of heaven. Something about Jesus, too, that uh, we need to remember is that he was appointed by God. God appointed Jesus our high priest. We did not choose him. We crucified him. We didn't choose Jesus to be our high priest. God chose him to be our high priest because God knew that he would be faithful. And the faithfulness of Jesus is what we need to stand in our place, for God knows that we are unfaithful. We are fickle and we are changeable. And so one of the characteristics of Jesus as our high priest is that God chose him and put him in that role and Jesus took that role and he qualifies for that role in every way. And so he can stand there and uh, <coughs> before God the Father and he can plead our case. But why is this so important in the last days? I see our time is gone. Why is this important for Seventh-day Adventists? Am I just preaching a, uh, a sermon uh, for the Jews of, of uh, Paul's time? Or am I preaching it for Seventh-day Adventists today? I would suggest there is a risk for Seventh-day Adventists today to, <coughs> and in the last days, especially as we uh, may have to go through the last days of Earth's history, there is a risk that we will lose the true significance of what it means to have a high priest in heaven. I think that Seventh-day Adventists, living particularly in the Western world, have life so comparatively easy that we will run the risk of thinking that we are doing so well that we can handle things ourselves. And we'll lose our dependence upon the intercessory work of Jesus, our high priest. You see, the high priest is the only one who can finally deal with our sins. And as we approach the end of time, temptation will become more and more uh, intense. Don't think that we, uh, avoid, that we can avoid temptation. The temptations that we talk about so often are those vile things, those terrible things that uh, are horrible and uh, that shock us. And we wouldn't get involved in any of those temptations. We just are horrified by them. But there's other temptations such as uh, I've been hurt and the temptation comes to you to hurt someone back. I've been offended and the temptation is to disassociate yourself from the church. And Paul gives a warning to the, uh, the people there in, uh, in Hebrews chapter 10. And he says, let us uh, <coughs> uh, hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. 
and uh, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good work. I didn't give you the verses, 22 and 23, chapter 10. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful and promised, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. How tempting it is sometimes to say, I've done my share and uh, it's time someone else did it. How tempting it is to turn things into internally. And the temptations that we will face in the last days will be the temptations perhaps to doubt that God is doing what he said he would do. I've heard good Adventists question whether God is really as good as he says he is when they read and hear and see earthquakes and tsunamis and plagues. And some years ago when the AIDS plague was uh, taking all the front lines of the newspaper, someone said to me, um, if God was really as good as he says, he would certainly draw the line at allowing AIDS. And your faith in Jesus as the intercessor starts to fail. If God is as good as he says he is, and I can't see it, then why is Jesus as good as he says he is? And I perhaps will live my life my way. And in some subtle way, I might save myself. Chapter 10 and verse 11 it says that every priest stands daily ministering and offering many times the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. From henceforth expecting or waiting until his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he has made perfect, perfected or completed forever them that are sanctified or those who have given their lives to the Lord. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us and, uh, <coughs> and uh, so it goes on. Jesus is standing at the right hand of God. Let us never lose confidence in Jesus as being the one who is able to deal with our sins. Finally, I would like to say, as we become more sanctified, if I can use that very Adventist term, as we become more sanctified, the big risk is that we will look back on our lives and we will say to ourselves, what a long way I've come. I used to be this and used to be that and now I'm this and that and now I don't do that and now I do do this and I'm really a lot better than I was before. I hope that in the things that we do and the things that we say, we've improved and there is a certain betterness that is involved in sanctification. But let's be very careful that we don't see ourselves as better than we are because in the last days, we will more than ever need the intercession of Jesus. For others, of course, there will be another factor. They will see themselves as they work through this work of sanctification, of being made holy, they will see themselves as they really are and will abhor themselves more than ever for their sinfulness. And the risk is that they will see so little good in themselves and see themselves as being impossible to save. You see, the devil works on both ends. It's like the old sales trick. You always have two lines. You have the best line and you have the second best line. And they both come out of the same factory. And I know a fellow that manufactures stuff and he has two lines and they all come out of the same plant. I just about gave it away, but uh, what sort of plant? But they all come out of the same machine and the same plant and one lot goes into this box and these are sold as a lower grade and those are sold as the high grade. And the high grade ones sell for say $2.50 and the low grade ones sell for $1.99 and the farmer's wives buy the ones for $1.99 and the, the uh, doctor's wives buy the ones for $2.50. Now, I can tell you something and make a confession here. I used to sell tomatoes in my roadside shop and tip them all out of the same box from 
Webbers or whoever it was that grew tomatoes here, whoever I got them from the market, I tipped them all out of the same box into two different bins and I priced one for $1.20 a kilo and one for 99 cents a kilo and the school teachers' wives and the doctors' wives paid $1.20 and the farmers' wives and, and, the, and the, uh, the workers' wives paid 99 they bought exactly the same tomatoes. The devil's got a trick that he gives us one end and the other end. He can make us so proud that we don't see the need for the intervention of Jesus before the Heavenly Father, or he can make us so discouraged that we fail to take advantage of it. And that's what Paul was trying to tell the Hebrew Christians. Never forget the intercessory power of our great high priest. Never forget his role. Seventh-day Adventists see the role of Jesus as our great high priest in a way that no other Christian church does. And I could go a long time to tell you why all that is. But the Seventh-day Adventist congregation today, I say to you, as Paul says, do not cast away your confidence in Jesus Christ, our heavenly high priest. Let's uh, sing together. <clears throat> My faith has found a resting place, not in a man-made creed. I trust the ever-living one that he for me will plead. Using a hymn book, it's 523, and we'll stand. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can have confidence in Jesus as our High Priest. And as we recognize our sinfulness and we sin and come short so often, we can turn to him and know that he is presenting our case before you and that he presents it as if we have never sinned at all because he has taken that punishment upon himself. We thank you for the exchange that is offered to us Pray that we'll always be conscious of what you are doing for us 
and that we will be faithful to the end and be able to have our place in your kingdom because we have totally trusted in Jesus Christ. We thank you and pray that you'll dismiss us from this service today with the assurance that we can find salvation in Jesus and him alone. This is our prayer, please, in Jesus' name. Amen.